Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so good morning, everybody. It's my uh, great pleasure to welcome Professor Alan Black uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, from the Language Technologies Institute here. Uh, I guess I've known Alan since, I don't know, 98-something. Yeah, basically when he moved to CMU from uh, University of Edinburgh, uh, where he uh, initially created the uh, festival uh, open source uh, uh, speech synthesis engine, which is is probably the most widely used uh, open source uh, synthesis engine out there, and uh, he's created lots of other uh, amazing technologies with with speech, doing speech to speech uh, translation on small devices and small footprint synthesizers, and lots of other really uh, amazing stuff. So uh, it's my uh, privilege to uh, have him here today to talk about um, recent work in uh, rapid development of uh, low resource languages. So, Thanks, Mike. It's nice to be here. I know some of you before, and so that's uh, um, good to be here. Um, although I have got this reputation in speech synthesis, um, as most of you know, I'm not primarily talking about speech synthesis here today. What I'm actually talking about is recognition and synthesis. And particularly, what we're interested in is being able to build support in all of those languages you've never heard before. Okay, so how can you actually do that? Okay, this is a joint work with uh, Tanya Schultz. Tanya is at CMU and she's also a professor at Karlsruhe. Some of you probably know who she is. And this is a joint work that we've been doing um, for the past, I don't know, five years maybe, um, where we're trying to actually take both of our technologies, recognition and synthesis, and put them much closer together so we can actually get support for uh, this. So normally what you would do is you're trying to get support in some new language. Think of a language that you're not very sure about. Um, you want to get speech recognition, so convert acoustic um, recordings to text. I'm sure you all know this. Speech synthesis, converting text into natural sounding. Um, speech for the requirements. You need some examples of text. You need some examples of acoustic recordings. You need a pronunciation lexicon. And you need a lot of skill construction. Okay? Many of us know how to do this. We've done this for years. And you know, once you've done your 40th language, you begin to think, can I automate this? Because you know, I know what to do, but you know, there's nothing new coming out of it. And how can we do it? But if you give it to external people to do, you suddenly discover that there's an awful lot of skilled knowledge in how you would go about doing this to be able to uh, um, uh, uh, get this to run well. Why do we care about it? You know, everybody can speak English, so why do we care? Everybody I speak to speaks English, you know, so why do we care? Well, it's probably not the best way of looking at it. Um, so, uh, so you're right, there are two people coming late. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so, you know, we can't really expect everybody to speak English. And even if they can speak English, it might not be appropriate for them to speak English or want to do it. In India, you have, you know, a billion people, um, many of whom speak English, or at least some form of English. Actually, they're the most common form of English. The rest of us are just speaking some other dialect of it. Indian English is the most common form. So how can we actually get it so that people can communicate in their own language? And there's an awful lot of languages in order to be able to do it. There's something in the regions of 6,000 languages in the world. And realistically, okay, there's probably only about 50 that are only going to be commercially viable in the normal sense of commercially viable. Okay? Um, uh, Europe has 20 plus uh, official languages, currently 27 official languages, which vary from German with lots of people to Maltese with 5,000 people. Um, but Europe also has lots of other minority languages, you know, uh, Catalan, Gaelic, um, uh, um, Basque, etc. Um, and so it would be good to be able to support them if you want to sell things to people. It's nice if you talk to them in their own language. Um, South Africa has 11 official languages. Um, uh, India has um, 17 or 21 official languages, depending who you speak to, but many, 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 many more. Okay. Um, why would you want to be able to do this? Well, you know, speech processing multiple language cross-cultural human-human interaction. It'd be nice to be able to have people can speak to each other in the translation sense. It'd be like to be able to deliver things to people by some human-machine interface. If you want to be able to give information, health information, um, product information, um, bus, flight, train information, it's nice to be able to communicate in their language rather than di dictating some, somebody else's language for them to be able to do it. Okay? The challenge is, actually, most of the things that we do in speech are already pretty much 
language independent. There are language specific things. You get tones in some languages, you get stress in others, you get no spaces in Chinese or Japanese or Thai um, between words. So there are things which are language specific, but in general, most of the techniques that we're doing have been shown to work fairly well for language. However, you know, we've only really addressed a number of languages um, already. Probably there's about less than 40 languages with trans um, transcriptions. Uh, sorry, less than 40 languages that have significant recordings and transcriptions in the world. Okay, remember taking uh, transcriptions about 40 times real time to be able to do large vocabulary pronunciation dictionaries. Probably less than 20 languages. You know, this is the 200,000 uh, um, word vocabulary. That's probably less than 20. You can name all the languages. Okay, um, uh, small corpora. There's probably less than 100 languages that really have real, you know, real coverage from that point of view. Um, and from the speech to speech translation, bilingual corpora are very rare um, and they're almost always in and out of English. Okay? Um, we desperately were looking for Catalan to Vietnamese translation um, data and there isn't much of that about. Okay? We probably now have the largest database of that. It's got 50 sentences in it. But anyway, um, uh, so if you're doing this cross information or you're just trying to get this the, the, so that, that you know, even if you look at English, the amount of work that's been done in English, you know, yeah, we can do speaker specific um, uh, quiet office recognition um, and uh, um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, um, uh, that you've got speaker specific type things and then you start to worry about broadcast news, you start to worry about real conversational speech, you care about multi-speaker speech, all of these things. You think that just even having recognition in one part of it is still something you're going to be able to do. Also, be aware of these 6,000 languages we're talking about, some of them don't have any writing system. Okay? Uh, people who speak them might be completely fluent in writing some other system, but they just don't write that, that language, even though it's the one that they communicate in every day. Okay? Um, Permanent solutions to this, collect lots of data and text, lexical construction. We have been distributing toolkits to be able to do this for years. There's lots of toolkits on how you do it. People know how to do it. Many of you guys have done it. Um, where um, we actually give tools that allow people to be able to build things. FestFox thing for building uh, synthesis voices. I have a list of 47 different languages that I know have been done in the FestFox thing. It might be more than that because it's open source. But you know that's quite a lot. That might even be the most of any set of tools. But you know, that's nothing compared to the 6,000 that's going to be out there. To do this, you're required to be an expert in speech technology. You have to know about what it means to build something in speech technology. You've got to be an expert in uh, export, expert in the target language. You have to know the language. It's really hard to build synthesizers and languages you don't know. I've done it, and you can't tell when, you know, the writing system is all backwards because it's Arabic and you didn't know. Um, I've been there. Um, and these two groups of people have to be able to communicate with each other which is also hard, actually, even though if they're, even if they're speaking the same language. Um, so the idea that Tanya and me had was to try to make it easier for people to build recognition synthesis in a new language. Okay? So we really want a system that's actually going to learn the language from the user. So we're taking the speech expert out of it and having the person who cares about the Hindi um, uh, support or the Basque support, they're the person who's actually going to drive the system. Well, the system's going to drive them, but we don't tell them that. Um, so the idea of the interactive uh, learning, so the user is actually going to um, uh, um, be involved in it and we're going to use them to be able to find out whether things are correct or not. We want to be able to make it um, much more efficient to collect um, data. So instead of, you know, um, the normal way I would say of doing it, you go and collect 100 hours of speech um, from, I don't know, 100, 200 different people. You want to be able to make it easier than this. We'd like to be able to speed up the cycles such that you can end up doing this in days rather than months. If you go to a commercial company to try to get support, they're probably going to quote you six months and they'll charge you twice as much for three months. Um, so what we're actually also interested in is some form of rapid language adaptation from universal models. So language universal models that we can then adapt to the target one rather than collecting everything native in the start. <coughs> so we're looking at bridging the gap between language and technology experts such that the people who care about using it are the people who are driving it and the language experts. Um, because you know, much as we like to train all of our students to be able to learn how to do these things, we'd like to be in a position where Anybody can use our technology without having to go through a master's at CMU. But if you want to do one, that's okay, although some of you already have one. Um, 
So we came up with SPICE, and SPICE stands for something, and with all research uh, um, systems with names, there's an acronym, and I have no idea what it is. It is the Speech Processing Interactive Creation and Evaluation Toolkit. Um, we came up with that first and then discovered it spelled SPICE. Um, funded by, uh, originally by National Science Foundation, the funding finished on this two years ago, and we've been using other funding to be able to build on top of it. Um, basically, we're bridging the gap between technology experts and language experts and speech recognition, machine translation, and text-to-speech. Okay? So the primary, primary work that we've been doing is in ASR and uh, TTS. Um, it's a web-based tool because we don't want people to download and try to install things that don't actually work or there are problems. We don't want them to deal with that. We want them just to go to a website that's going to work on all platforms, and they interact with that. And it's going to lead them through the stages you actually have to do that. You can go and try it now, cmuspice.org. Um, so you can go there and you can log in and you can see what our publication says. When you log in, you get something like this, okay? Which might be slightly out of date because we update it. Um, and basically, these are the stages that you're expected to be able to go through. And you're going to collect some text and it's going to automatically analyze that text and find the right type of prompts to do. And I'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to collect the audio across the web so we get access to everybody around the world rather than have to bring them into to Pittsburgh to be able to do that. Um, we uh, have an um, automatic way of bootstrapping lexicons, uh, optimizing the time that the human is actually involved. We bring acoustic models, language models, and um, speech synthesis, as one might expect. Yes, they will have to understand English to be able to do it. Yep, and um, that's exactly true. Um, we discovered that there is that could be a limitation. Okay, but um, one of the things and the other things is that it might be somebody who can set it up and then be able to get the, the people who are recording may not have to understand English to be able to do it. But there is an underlying assumption that they're going to. Um, for example, in India, almost everybody with a computer does understand English, even though they're working in another language. Okay, so technology people often understand English. But yes, you are, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, uh, so speech processing, we're trying to share information. Um, traditionally, the speech synthesis people and the speech recognition people don't talk to each other. And uh, so in other words, they develop their own things, their own phoneme sets. Um, the, to give you an example of when these things actually break down, uh, back in the days of Communicator, the CMU Communicator, uh, DARPA-funded uh, project for giving flight information, um, when you were speaking to the system, you would give one pronunciation, and when the system spoke back to you, it would give another. So if you say to the system, I'd like to fly to Atlanta, saying the proper British pronunciation of the city, Atlanta, um, the system would say it couldn't understand me. Okay? So I actually had to say, I'd like to fly to Atlanta, okay? the American pronunciation of it. Well, the system would say back to me, OK, flying to Atlanta. So it would actually give the British pronunciation of it. And that's very confusing to the user. So you really want to have these things actually mapped together from that point of view. So we're sharing text data for being able to build language models and working out nat any natural language processing, text front end stuff that you might be doing in the TTS. We're sharing pronunciation rules between the two in the phoneme set so that these things are really the same. Sometimes the TTS actually requires more information than the lexicon. So for example, tones or lexical stress, depending on the language, you may need to do that. And we also want to be able to share the acoustic model between the two, because we can actually do that to a certain extent to be able to share between the two systems. Um, I'm going to skip that part. Um, we like to record people. The easiest way to be able to bootstrap a system is to do um, uh, pre-recorded uh, information rather than collecting in the wild and getting somebody to transcribe it. Okay, this gives you a system that typically allows you to do simple dialogue systems and speech, speech translation systems pretty well. We're trying to find the nice prompts in a language we do not know. Okay, um, after a number of experiments we've been doing in speech synthesis over a number of years, we decided to do this um, also for speech recognition because it's sort of the same thing. You want the minimal number of prompts that you can get somebody to say that has the best coverage. So every new prompt you get, you want to get more information out of that than what you've got already. Um, so what we do is we take some large text corpus, okay, uh, some size, okay, uh, whatever it's going to be, and we try and find nice sentences. There's a nice technical word there, nice, okay. What we actually look for is, given the distribution, we look for high frequency words, okay, because we want to know what the pronunciation of these words are and we don't want unusual pronunciations. So as much as possible, we're trying to get high frequency words that are in the domain. Everybody likes to tell you that their text corpora is uh, not domain specific. It always is, okay. Um, we also want to have between about 5 and 15 words. Um, we want people to have their articulators running properly. And if you give them isolated words, they say things in a different way than what they would do for longer. And if you give somebody a prompt longer than about 15 words, um, 
they make, they make errors and you don't want them to make errors. So you actually, what you really like to be able to do is make this as easy to read, okay? Uh, but we don't quite have this. And at this stage, we don't actually have phoneme information because we're, this is an initial stage, so we're actually doing it um, text-based, okay? Um, we then try, for, from all of these nice ones, we want to optimize to get the coverage. So what we basically look at is try grapheme information. So you're trying to optimize to find the, um, the sentences with as most try grapheme coverage as possible. Okay? So you basically do greedy selection to be able to do that. If you have phoneme-based, but in this case we don't, um, you could do it on try phoneme-based. Now, even languages like English or Chinese, where the relationship between the writing system and the pronunciation is not very direct, Okay, that's, this still works well. We've done it for both English and we've done it for um, Chinese, and you get it. It's not as optimal as what you would get. For example, in English, there's almost no letters which directly go to the rare phoneme J. Okay, there's no standard letters, but there's words like vision and casual which actually have them in that are not borrowed words. Okay, um, and so you've got to get enough coverage to be able to do it. And we're typically looking for the regions of 500 to 1,000 sentences. Um, and you can, uh, has a base set that you're then going to pass out to people to be able to do this, okay? So we're collecting this for ASR and uh, um, uh, TTS acoustic modeling. Um, we need good text, well-written text, okay? You want it to be nice, okay? Um, so we basically are getting stuff from the web. You have to DHTML out. HTML, if I it, which can be hard because people put accents in different encodings to be able to do that. Preferably well written, and you'd like to minimize the misspelling. So rather than taking blog data, it'd be nice to take newspaper text if you can do that. But the high frequency stuff, by looking for the high frequency things, you actually end up with at least a common way of spelling, even if it isn't correct. Okay? Um, we're currently not dealing with uh, word segmentation automatically in the system. Um, uh, so basically, for the people that are doing Chinese, Japanese, and uh, Thai, we ask, it, ask, ask them to be able to do word-separated things. But these are major languages rather than minor languages, and many of the minor languages are, are easier, actually. Um, natural text is often a mixed language, so when we do this from Hindi, what you end up is one of the really nice phrases that comes out is something like, copyright New Delhi Times 2008, because it appears on every single page. It's very high frequency, and it's written in English. Okay, so we don't really want that. Okay, so you often get mixed things. So the things that you get out of this it's often not ideal, but it's usually pretty good. And then the first person reading it can go, yes, 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 no, 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 yes, yes, to be able to make decisions to do this. We've done this for the so-called Arctic speech databases um, using this technique, and a number of people have used this within the FESFOC stuff for being able to build this directly. But um, we found that automatically, we've done this for some 23 different languages, that it's pretty good for being able to find things. <laughs> A writing system? Uh, um, hang on, uh, yes. It's about 500 to 1,000 of the 6,000 have actually got a regular writing system, but the other one, it's very hard to define in some cases because some people write it. Okay, but it's about 500 to 1,000, so you're maybe talking of, of somewhere in the regions of um, a sixth have got a regular writing language. I think that. This is from um, Richard Sprott's book. Tanya Schultz for her PhD. Um, last century, um, just to make her feel old, um, uh, um, uh, did this project called Global Phone, where she basically had a standardized way to be able to collect data from 15 different languages. Okay, and since then, we've continued to be able to collect languages from what we've been doing. And the point here was to try and get it as a wide range of languages, both from a linguistic point of view and a geographical point of view. Okay. Um, uh, Native speakers, uh, uh, the, the basic thing was random student at um, Kölzer University in Germany was given a free laptop to be able to go to their home country and be able to record data, okay? And they had to build lexicons and uh, um, collect language for language models, okay? And this gives us a big database which has got very good coverage of phonemes, almost all types of phonemes throughout the world, okay? And this is important because this is going to be our underlying model that we're going to use to be able to bootstrap our system, okay? Um, the speech recognition rates on these, there are definitely different qualities that we're actually getting. Japanese is relatively easy. German, well, it was done in Germany. Um, English, and so as you can see, they get a little bigger. Russian is probably the worst, and that's not because I think Russian is harder. I think it's not as good a database as uh, some of the other ones. More recently, we've done Afrikaans, um, Chinese, Arabic, um, and Iraqi. Um, a point to note that I usually think that if you get below 20% word error rate, you can usually do pretty reasonable spoken dialogue systems. 
Okay. Um, getting below 10% is cool. That's you definitely need that for dictation, but we're not talking about dictation tasks from that point of view. Um, so the idea of the rapid portability of acoustic models is what we're actually going to do is initialize the models from similar phonemes in other languages that have got the same phonetic properties, okay? And then be able to take that and be able to do adaptation for the target one to be able to get, you make use of global phone information to be able to give us, and then do adaptation to it, and so you need much less data to be able to do that. Um, so we actually do have to depend on a universal sound system, and so we're actually asking for people to define their phoneme set in their language. I'll come back to that issue later because that can be quite hard. You have to have knowledge about it. Okay? Not, not all native speakers don't really know about the phonemes in the language. Um, what you discover when you actually look over this is there are lots of overlap with languages and genuine overlap with languages. Okay? It really is the case that you know, um, certain pronunciations of T in one language are really the same as T in the other across the whole planet. Okay, so there's lots, vowels can be very different, but it's a good place to be able to start. So we can actually look at this, um, if we can map some IPA-based universal sound inventory into what the target uh, phoneme set is, we can actually do something and end up with uh, something that allows us to do this. And then we can basically do the adaptation and training that allows us to be able to end up with something which is quite reasonable. Okay, um, so here's an example of uh, um, Portuguese. Um, uh, basically, um, by collecting um, uh, data with Portuguese, and uh, we initially start off with um, the amount of data of... Uh, um, okay, so here we're basically, if we use all global phone data and no data from Portuguese, okay, we end up with a 69.1% um, uh, uh, word error rate okay, of for our uh, recognizer. That's not particularly good. Okay? Um, if we give it 15 minutes, okay, um, uh, um, we end up with 57, okay, um, which is still not good enough. Okay? If we use our, um, our basically tag the phonemes with which language they actually come from, you can actually get it down to 49. Okay? Um, if you give it a little bit more data, you can get it down to 40. Okay? If we do um, uh, 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 more information about the um, language that it comes from, we can actually um, do this in some of the word of uh, why you actually basically does um, uh, better tree tying on it. And you can actually get it around to 19.6 uh, um, with an hour and a half amount of data. If we use all of the um, uh, data from Portuguese, which is 16 hours, 16 and a half hours, we get 19. So the difference between these two, okay, will not make much difference in, ru in, in runtime, but the difference between collecting an hour and a half of speech as opposed to collecting 16 hours of speech is quite significant. Okay? So the point is that being able to initialize our models with appropriate uh, context-dependent training, you can actually get something that's pretty similar to what you're actually doing than just using the raw data and um, collecting it from the target language. Um, in SPICE, back into the system, we actually ask people to be able to type in the names of their phonemes and we give them the standard uh, vowel chart to be able to do it. Rather importantly, we actually give people, if they click on the symbols round about it, they get to hear what it sounds like. Okay? So you can have some way of actually getting people to be able to do that. Um, and so not just do you get the chart and you can put in your, no, your names for it, but we've actually got recordings of people saying all of these different phonemes, which is hard to get, um, to be able to do that. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so it's very so one of the things about the IPA is that everybody claims it's universal, okay? But uh, there's a whole bunch of things that are actually missing from it, and very quickly you find there's no tonal information, which messes up a whole bunch of languages. Um, actually, in the standard forms, you don't even get all of the different stops that are in standard Indian languages, so they are missing from it. So we've added them, okay? So actually, the answer is no; it doesn't cover everything, but it's probably good enough. Okay, because in all forms of acoustic processing, what you typically end up with is some form of a phoneme, which you then map into a different form. Take, for example, R, as in Scottish English, okay, which is not what the Americans say for R. Um, it, it's typically still labeled with a phoneme R, although the allophone is somewhat different between the different languages, okay, different dialects. But you're still dealing with the same form, and that's typically good enough. Okay. Um, pronunciation. I'm actually going to... Um, uh, um, uh, oh, right, okay, I have this one, so I'll talk about this. Can you do all of this with graphemes rather than phonemes? Okay, 
So you're in a new language that you don't know anything about. You just take the writing system and you try to map it. And you pretend each letter, um, orthographic uh, form in the language, is the phoneme. Okay? And this works surprisingly well. Okay? Everybody thinks that, oh yeah, it would work for Spanish, but it's not going to work for anything else. In Spanish, C can be pronounced lots of different ways. It can be pronounced S, it can be pronounced TH, if you're from uh, um, uh, um, continental Spain. It can be pronounced CH, depending on the context. Okay, and maybe even K for borrowed words. Um, but here's uh, examples of grapheme, um, uh, phoneme grapheme recognition and uh, improvements for the flexible tree, tree tying. So again, worrying more about context dependency to be able to do this. So if we end up with the data with 11.5, uh, we end up with 19.2 uh, um, just by using uh, English. That's still sort of okay. And if it saves you getting the phonemes, it can actually help. And it depends on them. Spanish is actually surprisingly worse. Uh, but again, I think that's to do with the database. German, it's actually better. I can say this because Tanya isn't here. I think the lexicon for German isn't very good. Okay, but you didn't hear me say that. Um, apart from this is being recorded and going out on the on the web, so she'll call me later. Um, Russian again is not very good, but Thai is uh, sort of reasonable as well, and you can do quite well. And this may be an easier way to be able to address the issue because if you can get almost as good without the knowledge of the phoneme, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it'd be a good way to be able to do it. Okay. There are issues with doing this. We've done this with synthesis as well, and we find very similar results. Um, the issue is that when it's wrong, how do you fix it? Okay. So if you suddenly have a new name, okay, and you want to be able to get the pronunciation of, I don't know, um, uh, um, uh, Colin Powell's name correct, and his name is Colin, not um, Colin, okay, yet it's written in the same form. How do you specify that it's got a different pronunciation if you don't have phonemes? Well, you have to do some form of rewriting it in something in other letters which are similar, which may not be easy in some languages. We have a dictionary bootstrapping system when we're dealing with phonemes, and we've done quite a lot of work on this, and the cost of asking somebody to fix the lexicon versus how good it actually gets and what the best way to be able to do this. And what we do is we set up some word list, okay, um, which is probably based frequency based, okay, and we select some word from it, okay, and we generate the pronunciation if the first case, nothing, okay, um, but if we've got some form of mapping letters to uh, pronunciations at all, we'll use it, okay, um, but using uh, um, grapheme to phoneme rules, we then use a text-to-speech synthesizer for it, which is only phoneme-based. We actually use our IPA recordings to be able to do that. So you can hear whether the pronunciation is right. A string of phonemes, people find it quite hard to know whether it's right. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. What we then do, if it's okay, it gets put in the lexicon. If it's not, you actually say, well, correct it. Okay. Um, and then we put it in the lexicon. And we update our letter-to-sound rules each time. And what you discover very quickly is actually you end up with a much better lexicon much faster because you're dealing with the things which actually are improving uh, pronunciation. And we've, we've done this for a number of languages and shown that this is definitely the case. Um, there's also been work done by uh, Marilee Deval in her PhD at the University of Pretoria, um, which was in similar work, and we actually shared some of the things. She discovered that actually playing the TTS made a big difference to accuracy, okay? even if you're an expert, which is quite interesting. The other thing that we discovered is that um, you can skip a word. If it's really wrong, it's better to skip it because it's just too much time it takes to actually fix it. Okay? And it's better just to fix the things that have got um, similar um, single things wrong on it. So we have a Lex Learner, and basically, it, it, it's basically, you know, we're 3% through, and we're at the word at. It gives a pronunciation, or it says that it's going to be AXT. There's a list of phonemes which are actually in your language. You can only type phonemes that are in your language. Um, you can listen to the pronunciation that gets pronounced here. You can accept it, you can skip it, um, or you can remove this word if it's not a valid word. It's maybe the wrong language, or something's just wrong with it, okay? And so we can actually use the system to be able to do incremental learning. And um, sometimes it gets us wrong. Here we have a word, I don't know, gene? Gian, don't know, Go ahead. and its pronunciation is I don't know because I've never seen the J yet, um, and it's got that, and you can hand correct it to be able to do it or skip it to be able to do that. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to make the best use of the human. You're trying to optimize the human. You've got the human who understands what the language is, and you're trying to find the best way for them to be answering questions which will give you the most information as quickly as possible. Okay? Um, we still have issues on when do you stop? Okay, we don't have perfect recognition um, lexical pronunciation for English because there's always new words that come into the language which aren't covered, and anybody 
in the commercial field is probably adding to the lexicon regularly when new names come in or new famous people that you want to make sure that you're covering. But you know, from an initial stage, how far do you go? Okay. Um, well, you can look at distribution and find out what you know how much of the tokens you're covering. You can also guess as you go through how well you're guessing. Okay, so you can actually find out and you can compare that to other languages and find out how well. So for English, uh, for example, using CMU Dict, um, we've probably got about 4% of tokens of the Wall Street Journal don't appear in, the, um, in CMU Dict. Okay? Um, of those for letter to sound rules, how many are we getting right? Well, it's probably about 60% given our experiments. Okay? So of tokens, okay? tokens, not of, of uh, um, uh, types. Okay, so actually you're doing pretty well, okay, and so if you can actually get something which is up in the regions of token coverage 85, 90%, which is relatively easy to do, you've probably got a lexicon that's reasonable to be able to do that. You've also got to deal with the case that uh, people make errors. If you go, is this right, is this right, is this right, is this right, people go, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so you also have to deal with issues on there to make sure, and so it'd be good to have multiple people to be able to do that. Um, you've got to have... Uh, um, Keep them motivated. One of our big errors that we started off before, it, we used to say the number of um, uh, tokens were covered rather than the number of types that were covered. So it used to start off saying, you know, you've done three and you've, got, you've done 0 0.000378%. You know, you have got a millennium to go before you're going to finish. And we found that that wasn't a good way to keep people motivated. So we changed that. The task is still as hard, but you just change the way of in incentivizing them to, uh, to do that. Um, rapid language portability when it comes to language modeling. Okay? Um, you might think that there's, there's nothing you can do cross language, but what you discover is lots of languages have actually got a certain amount of shared information in them, especially for uh, um, large languages. We did some experiments with Bulgarian, and we found that we could actually improve things by using Russian. Okay? Um, we also find that we could do this for improving Iraqi in using modern standard Arabic. That one's maybe a little bit more believable because there's going to be modern standard Arabic phrases in Iraqi Arabic. All the Arabic dialects are different. They're not the same language. And when people speak to each other, they basically drift up into modern standard Arabic so that they can make themselves understood. But when they're chatting to somebody else from their own country, you know, the Moroccan people and the Iraqi people are actually uh, um, speaking a language which is really quite different from that point of view. So we can actually share information like that too. Let's get on to TTS. We can do the same thing in TTS where we can actually use information from other languages to be able to initialize our models and then be able to do some form of adaptation to be able to get closer to the target language that we want to do. Okay? So it's following the same ideas in Global Phone to be able to do it. Um, we have a text-to-speech um, uh, um, page. This is the example of this. And basically, we uh, create this or recreate uh, from the imported waves that have been recorded. We import the prompts, uh, lexicon, we label everything with the HMM labeler, and we basically, et cetera, build the thing. There. Next one it tells me about the synthesizer. Yes. OK. So in the, in the um, form, we're actually using parametric synthesis. This is often called HMM synthesis. It's made famous and uh, pioneered by um, Keiichi Tokuda from the Guy Institute of Technology. Those of you who know my uh, background might be a little surprised that I'm in that domain. I'm Mr. Unit Selection, which was the, the technology over the last 10 years. Um, statistical parametric synthesis is a speech synthesis technology for the next 10 years. Okay, take it from me. Um, and the reasons that we want to be able to do this is because statistical parametric synthesis is actually much more robust to errors and much better in small amounts of data. Okay? I also believe it's how we're all going to do synthesis in the long term. But basically, in unit selection, what you're doing is you're taking an instance of some piece of speech, probably phoneme or bigger size. Okay? Um, while in statistical parametric synthesis, you really have a genuine um, uh, um, generative model, and you're basically taking the average of pieces of speech. Now, as all of, all of you know, if you've got one or two things that are wrong and you're taking an average of 100, okay, the one or two things which are wrong are irrelevant or almost irrelevant um, to taking the average. But in unit selection, what happens is you're picking instances. Okay, and the chances of picking one of these bad ones, okay, which will make the synthesizer sound bad, increases. So what you want to be able to do is make sure that you don't include those, and therefore we've been using a parametric synthesizer. We use ClusterGen, which is a synthesizer that I wrote. 
um, which is part of the festival distribution. It's following a lot of the HTS. I don't call it HMM synthesis because it doesn't contain any HMMs. But actually, if you look at HTS, which is called HMM synthesis, it doesn't include any HMMs either. Not at synthesis time, at labeling time it does, in the same case that we do here. Um, we can make this synthesizer work with as little as 10 minutes of speech. Okay. Um, we can robust to errors. Unfortunately, the quality of the speech that comes out of it okay, um, is a little buzzy. It's not as bright as what you would get out of targeted synthesizer. Okay? But it's still perfectly understandable. One thing that is a problem that on 10 minutes of speech, it's hard to get good prosody out of it because prosody is a bigger thing and you need more examples of that. And that's still a research thing to be able to do it. But the quality of synthesis you're getting out of this is you can transcribe everything and understand what's being said. Dan. Mm -hmm. When do you see it solve the prosody over the, that, that kind okay, of Okay, so first we have to solve natural language prosody, which um, requires us to do full understanding of the things that actually have to be said. We're not going to do that, okay? But how soon are you going to get prosody coverage that's going to be as good as your best unit selection? Right. Yeah, it's probably one person's PhD with a bunch of follow-on stuff, okay? So that's probably in the regions of three to five years uh, to be able to do that. And um, we've already started doing to see if when we're talking about taking acoustic models over multiple languages, can you take prosodic information over multiple languages and share it? Now, prosody is very different in different languages, okay? The choices that you make, Oh, Dan's in the audience, so I can use him as an example. Dan is a Romanian speaker, and he has a particular intonation pattern in English, which is based on Romanian. And it's the way I fundamentally recognize Romanian English speakers. Okay? Because you have a time-based language rather than a stress-based language. Um, and that's really the underlying reason that you end up with Romanian speakers having different intonation. But if you can find um, shared intonation, say, between um, Danish, German, Dutch, um, uh, not, not Swedish, um, uh, uh, Norwegian, okay, you can actually use that information for some other um, Germanic language and it will be pretty good, okay, because the intonation patterns in these languages are very similar, okay, so if you can actually do that. So that's one of the things that we could do. Um, here's our actual much more detailed uh, um, breakdown of what we actually did with this. We had this student a number of years ago, um, uh, um, uh, Engelbrecht, Hermann Engelbrecht, who's not German, who's from South Africa, um, and uh, he basically built an Afrikaans English speech to speech translation system using actually just before the website stuff, but all the underlying tools to be able to do. And we get a breakdown of the time and effort that he did for all the things that he actually did. Okay, so ASR was standard um, Janus stuff using the Janus toolkit, HMMs, all, uh, MT was statistical MT, TTS was unit selection rather than uh, HMM synthesis because we did this about three years ago. Um, and the dictionary was using cart-based decision tree stuff, um, which is typically quite good, but is not incremental, okay? Because um, you have to retrain after each form. He had text from uh, um, transcriptions from um, the South African Parliament, so he had a number of uh, um, uh, bilingual aligned corpus, six hours of red speech, about 10,000 utterances that he was actually working with, okay? Um, what was the time that he did for the different, different parts, okay? Um, data. Okay, preparation type stuff, okay, was by far the biggest part, okay, which is actually quite interesting because we've been addressing this issue of trying to use a website to be able to make sure that all the data we get is in the right format. If it's not, you spend all your time dealing with data. Um, uh, the actual core training things of the number of hours that you're actually doing this, okay, um, is uh, smaller, okay. Um, tuning, okay, um, uh, clearly the uh, TTS and the MT worked perfectly. Um, because only the ASR was actually tuned. That's probably not the case, okay? But he spent all the time in making sure that the tuning is, and we've also been doing things to uh, do this. Evaluation, approximately five in the prototype where he actually built the system together and took the models out of the system and actually put it into one of our frameworks to be able to do that, okay? Um, so he was doing this over a period of about six weeks, okay? And that's the breakdown that he had. And we do notice that the data preparation is by far the biggest thing, and that's one of the things that led us to, to worry about the website, um, in order to be able to do that. Right. Is that one that you can reuse over languages? Um, so we actually um, use the same questions, okay, but we retrain it for every language. Yes, but the questions are the same. Hmm? The, the questions are the same. The questions are the same. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so this is something which I always surprised me in uh, 
in speech recognition is you care a lot about these questions, but in speech synthesis, we use sort of the same things, but we use techniques to automatically pick the best questions. So uh, I think this is sort of less of an issue. Get, getting the right features in there are typically, and we've basically got phonetic information because we have phonetic information because all our phonemes go back into the IPA. So we actually have phonetic features for all of those. And then you can basically use reasonable, you know, cart building techniques to be able to do that. Um, Uh, this was spring this year, and we're running it again uh, this semester. We had 11 students in the class, and this was the second time we really ran it as a class, the first time everything almost broke. Um, we had two Hindi speakers, two Vietnamese speakers, one French, one, uh, two German, Bulgarian, Telugu, Cantonese, and Mandarin. That was the languages that we actually did. And Turkish. Turkish must have been the year before. Um, uh, um, nobody was a native English speaker, but hey, at CMU, almost nobody's a native English speaker, you know, including me. Um, uh, they were, their task was to build a complete speech-to-speech -speech translation system, so not just building the speech part, but building some form of uh, translation part. Um, so they were in teams in random other languages that would choose them to be able to do that. Translation was simple phrase-based, so it was basically give a bunch of phrases. They trained it through our statistical MT system, but that really wasn't... Uh, um, the, point, the point that we were trying to do here is that many of our students get expertise in speech recognition or speech synthesis or uh, information retrieval or, or translation, but they never get the experience of building the whole system. Okay, so we actually were making sure that we were getting them full experience of building everything. Um, we were also doing this to debug our system. You know, it's a good way to debug your system. All of our ex-students have graduated now, so I can give that trick to them. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and... Uh, Evaluating the results, basically, we were wanting to collect much more data to be able to evaluate future um, improvements to the system, to be able to make sure that um, we're improving the system. And we've done a bunch of things to be able to improve it that I'll just talk about in a minute. Does it work? Yes. Yes, it really does work. OK, there's no question about that. Does it work for everybody? No. OK. Um, sometimes things fail miserably in ways that are not obvious whatsoever to the student. Um, um, let me give an example of Vietnamese. Um, are you a Vietnamese speaker or you are a Vietnamese speaker? Yeah, I know what it's history is that. But uh, um, uh, Vietnamese one failed miserably. Um, and uh, we took some time to be able to look at what it was. And it was basically the website's encoding was lying. And it was sometimes UTF-8 and it sometimes wasn't. But it told us all the time it was UTF-8. And so we treated it as UTF-8. Uh, and that doesn't work. Because okay? you then get just random bytes coming out of it that, that don't really have. And so everything failed from that point of view. Um, how can you tell it worked? Okay? So um, here's a little story about doing speech synthesis in Chinese the first time that I did it. Um, I built a Chinese synthesizer. And I built it. And I typed in some Chinese. And Chinese came out. And I thought, that's just so cool. So I went and got one of my Chinese colleagues across to listen to it. And they said, that's so cool. What language is it? Oh, right. OK. The problem is, if you're doing work in another language, you can't tell whether it works. Actually, it's much worse than that. And the point is that you'll think it works, because you've spent a lot of time on it. OK? So it sounds Chinese to you, even if you don't know Chinese. And that's not good enough. OK? So you have to be able to find a way to make it good. You know, the system has to be able to do that. And so we have to find objective and subjective ways of being able to ensure that the thing that we've generated is actually reasonable. Okay, and that's an important thing that we have to do, and I'll address that in a minute. Um, how can you make it better? Okay, so it doesn't matter how good you've ever made anything. Okay, what your boss is going to say immediately afterwards, that's amazingly cool, now can we make it better? Okay, so you've got to keep something back. And so it's like, if you build a model for Hindi, for Urdu, how can you then make it better? Okay, and so that's one of the things we want to do. And also talk about some of the things that are problems that we've identified that... Um, we don't have answers for yet, and they basically are, are research issues. So, automatic evaluation. How can you tell that the synthesizer is good automatically? Okay. Should it work? Hmm? Right. Well, uh, you know, um, you take random languages, and, and you, can, you know, it actually works. Uh, so, um, you know, to be fair, that was not true the first year that we actually ran it, and it was not a 80% success. It was a nice round number that wasn't 100 okay of success it didn't work okay um, and there was always somebody like me or tanya going into the background and changing something to make it work but ooh, that was the first year we did it the sort of second year that we did it it did actually work such that when i say work such that at the end the student spoke into it 
Okay? It recognized what they said. They put that into the synthesizer, and you could recognize what was actually coming out of it. Okay? So you, it does work at that level. Okay? So, yeah. But some of them, I mean, the, 80, you know, the Vietnamese example, that was an identifiable one okay, of why it didn't work. But one of the Hindi ones didn't work, and one of the Hindi ones did. So I don't really know the answer to that. Okay? Bad record? I don't know. Okay? So there's still issues on that. Um, in speech synthesis, we've been centering on the spectral measure where you actually take held out data and you take synthesized data and you do this spectral distance. It's basically a Euclidean distance in the malcapsule domain called MCD. It's typically used for speech synthesis optimization and uh, voice conversion um, optimization. And so we've been using that and we've basically, because we now have 14 nice clean languages that we've actually been working on testing, you can find out what's the expected value that you have given the amount of data you have and importantly, the amount of time you spend on the lexicon. So we can actually look at um, what the, the distribution is. This is work that John Cominant, one of my students, has done. And he has a, um, a, a paper at a Vietnamese conference earlier this year that actually described all of that stuff. And so basically, he has the information of what the expected form is, the number would be, given the amount of data that you actually have in the language. Okay? So we can apply that to the system, and we can work out whether we think that the number that we're getting out is good or bad. Okay, because this is the thing you have to tell the person is like, is this reasonable? You can also do automatic listening tests, and this is something that we've also done as well. So basically, you synthesize it and ask people to write down what they hear. Okay, in most reasonable text to speech, people are pretty near about 90, 95 percent correct if you ask them to write it down. Okay, they may not like the synthesizer, it may sound like a robot, but it's still good enough that people can actually understand it. In English synthesis, we actually typically don't do that because synthesis is too good. And we actually do what's called semantically unpredictable sentences, where we do completely random words um, together, but are at least grammatically correct, and then ask people to write them down. Okay? And they're very hard, even when you have a human read them. Isn't that right, Stephanie? Um, she had to read them out. Yes. Yeah. Is your space um, package generating the automatic listening tests? Yes. Like as, so part as part of it, so the evaluation comes out and says it has held out data and this is synthesize these and tell me what you read. So yes, we do that. Um, this has been an offline back thing and we get a number out of it and we're trying to say things like if it's less than six, it's probably okay. okay? And if it isn't, there's something wrong. Uh, but you can't necessarily tell what's wrong. Another area in speech recognition we've been doing is bootstrapping uh, language modeling. So basically, given the text that we are given by the human who wants to do it, we basically do information retrieval analysis, um, uh, TDIF type stuff on it to try to find the most discriminatory bigrams with respect to a background model that are likely within that language. And then given those, we then go off and actually do um, further searches on the web for more appropriate data. Okay? And so this means that you have some data and it goes and finds more appropriate data that has got the right type of language background. And we particularly did this, we had a paper at, in Lisbon um, about this. Um, the tests were all done in Hindi. Um, and uh, the uh, data was um, uh, basically it was two particular domains we were looking at. One was um, recipes, okay? And the other one was the most important thing to Hindi speakers, which is cricket. Okay, and we basically, it, and it did the right thing. It you know, went away and got the right information and found the right pages in Wikipedia, the Hindi Wikipedia that were on cricket and related aspects of game playing and famous cricketers. Um, and also it went and found various recipe things. So, it, I mean, it's doing that and we get reduction in, in language model. And this is actually one of the things that we're very much aware of, that we have now feel we've got to the stage where we can actually build this system that will give you models but we all know when you're actually doing real systems, if you're doing a telephone dialogue system, you go and take models from somewhere else. And then the hard thing is tuning it for your particular domain. And so this is something that we're trying to get a better handle on and being able to do automatically. The things we've not done, okay, which are still major issues in trying to do this completely automatically in new languages. One is text normalization. You can sort of think of a noisy channel model. You've got a bunch of words that are coming in, and you're going to get them converted. Think about numbers. You get a string of digits. How do you actually pronounce them? Most of these are somewhat programmatically defined. Okay? But actually, in text, you get this all the time, much more than just numbers. You get abbreviations. You get letter sequences. You get punctuation choices, which are obvious to the reader and unobvious to the machine. Okay? If you look at the work in text-to-speech on this, it's basically, well, people typically come up with a bunch of hacky rules 
or maybe they come up with a bunch of nice, highly trained automatic models from data that they then augment with a bunch of hacky rules. Um, and nobody really has a good solution to be able to do this. And we're wondering if you could actually do this in new languages um, to be able to do it. One of the issues that we notice in a lot of our um, systems is that um, people are often in bilingual or multilingual environments. If you go to India and try to deal with Hindi, you discover that almost nobody speaks Hindi in their full sentence. They'll typically include other words in it, often English. Okay? And they, that's just not a problem. Okay? So in high-tech fields, you're even more likely to find it. That you'll find English borrowed words or phrases actually even coming in from that point of view. And so we have to make sure that we can actually properly identify and change the pronunciation when we're dealing with an English word as opposed to a true Hindi word. Um, the other thing we're interested in doing is correcting in situ. So instead of actually having the developer worry about it, that he, has a, he or she has the system that comes out of it, that if you deploy it, there's a way for it to be able to improve with um, actual usage. One of the things that we know in um, speech to speech translation, in dialogue systems, you build this system, you think it's cool, you deploy it, it fails miserably, but you collect data from its first um, uh, deployment and then you label that data and then you add that data to the system and the system gets much better okay, when you actually put it in the domain to do it. And the question is, can you do this automatically? Okay. Um, oh, this is a good example to give here in Microsoft. Um, so, for example, in the Microsoft Live thing on my phone when I speak to it and say something like Chinese restaurant to it, okay, it will give me a bunch of um, uh, examples about what it thinks that I said. Okay. And if I then click... Um, the, the Chinese restaurant out of Indian restaurant or Taiwanese restaurant or something, and check the, the, the Chinese one, it knows that I really meant to say Chinese uh, um, restaurant, and that actually gives data back to Microsoft. I hope you guys are actually using this um, back to it in order to use uh, retraining, or you probably are getting it and not doing anything with it, but that's your problem. Um, <laughs> Oh, there's a paper to sit down this. Okay, right. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, it's hard to get, but you know, you're getting direct feedback about whether it actually works or not. And that's a really good thing to be able to do. And we've actually been doing this in our speech-to-speech -speech translation systems to try to improve the, <coughs> of being able to take information from its first usage and try to make things better automatically. Okay. Um, there's a non-trivial task of uh, engineering. Um, it's good that students at CMU are very good at programming because there are lots of programming tasks you have to do to be able to make a system that's going to be robust enough to do this. You wouldn't believe what people actually, well, you probably would believe what people actually do when you give them a website to be able to do it. They will upload things in weird formats that you know nothing about despite telling them that they're not supposed to do that. Um, they'll find yet another archiver for the um, text that they want to upload that we have no access to and no idea what it is to unpack it. And so you'll suddenly get these files that are just binary to us because we don't know that they're compressed. Um, uh, and so there's constant things about trying to make it the data that's coming in to be as standard as possible. If people follow the standard route, it's probably going to work, but they'll always find ways to, to do things differently. So being able to automatically detect that is still something that we're fundamentally worried about. But that's, you know, that's a different type of research um, part, but we're still actually worried about that. And finally, um, so the rapid language adaptation, you know, speech models by language experts. It's not by speech experts. That's really what we're fundamentally trying to do. So we're trying to open it up outside, okay? It's very nice of DARPA to give us that money every year to do some random other language, but ultimately we think that, let's not say that that's solved, but we think that we can push that out of the research lab and into the end user to be able to do that. We want to be able to share, um, uh, sharing between models in languages, okay? So we've got... Um, pronunciation models, acoustic models being shared between TTS and, and uh, recognition, but we're also trying to share the models between the languages themselves. So if you can find similar languages, either from a, 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 a linguistic point of view or there's a shared vocabulary, which often happens, find ways to be able to automatically do that, or acoustics. And acoustics doesn't necessarily mean that you're sharing languages that have got similar geographic forms. The phoneme set in Italian is very similar to the phoneme set to uh, Japanese, but I don't think anybody's going to complain that, uh, claim that these languages are in any way related. Okay? Um, it's not relevant. If, they're, if, they, if they improve models, then it's a reasonable way to do it. Um, Auto-evaluation techniques are still something. What you want to be able to do is tell the user whether it works or not. And you also want to tell the user what's wrong. Okay? Hey, as a researcher, I'd like to be able to tell me that as well. But that's something that we're still working on and being able to improve. And the more data we get, we're actually getting more information about it. And continuing on, application 
um, dependent adaptation. So once you take your models in Hindi and put it into your pizza ordering system, well, it's probably chicken tikka ordering system, um, you want it to be able to improve and be able to have a way to do that. And all that fine tuning that we do as speech researchers, we'd like to be able to move out into the, into, so that other people can benefit from that and that we don't have to do it. Um, full text normalization discovery is something which uh, um, I'd really like to start getting into because it's becoming more and more an issue in things like um, language modeling and text-to-speech. Okay? And it's something that we're going to have to actually deal with, especially when you're f doing found data on the web because it's not going to be as clean as what you actually want it to be. And uh, better use of the end users in improving the system itself. So you're, you're, you're getting the users to improve the system. Okay? They're the ones who care most, and they're the ones that you want to be able to help most in improving the system. And they know the language best from that point of view. Okay. Do we have any questions? So are you taking advantage of any users who, uh, user agents, or be happy to want the same language? So uh, actually, we're not at the moment. So there's no actual way to share the data between different people who log in. But this is something that we do want to be able to do. Such if you say, I want to do Hindi, and say, oh, here we are. Or if you want to say something like, I want to do Gujarati, um, we can say, it's probably being written in the Devanagari uh, um, uh, um, writing system. And therefore, we'll import all the things and the basic pronunciations that we're likely to get from that, and probably the phoneme set as well, that you can then edit and change around. So this is something that we'd like to be able to do, but we've not actually done this at the moment. So it can, it can give you, if you're doing an extension to a language that's already covered, or if you've got related information from another language, the writing system is a good example, that you want to be able to get that information passed between it. There, actually, the number of writing systems is relatively small, and uh, we started putting them in as defaults. So you, know, you identify your language system as being a Latin-based system. Um, uh, so it's using Latin 1 or ISO 8559. Um, so you want to be able to do that, but you find that there's lots of languages on the fringe that actually don't include that. German, for instance, has got sharp S, the double S, and it's not actually in Latin 1. So you have to have a little bit bigger view of it to be able to do that. But that all worked until we discovered people were using Latin alphabets for describing languages. For example, um, upper and lower case meant different phonemes. And we thought if you used the Latin, we could actually do case folding, but you can't in some languages because they actually make a distinction between that. So some of the Indian languages, if they're not normally written, they may write them in a, um, in a, a Latin-based language, and so that might be an issue from that point of view. So yeah, we want to be able to share more things because there's lots of information that's already in there to be able to do that. How, how do you think that uh, the system that you have can work you know, if, I, if, I, if you deploy the system and wait for 10 years, uh, and you get more data, you get more people, uh, how do you think you, it will work for a higher quality system? Well, um, there's clearly, you know, the longer you have it, if you have this feedback and correction and sharing of data, so you collect more data, um, you get them to correct things if they're wrong, like it's perfectly reasonable for your key words in your domain where the pronunciation is wrong for you to correct them. Everybody thinks that's a reasonable thing to do. And so if you're getting for every time somebody uses it, you get another 20 words out of it, you're actually going to be able to improve the system from that point of view. Decisions that you make you know, to, to get to a certain level quickly, like uh, yes. uh, HMN synthesis, for instance. Yes. And, and that you, you, can, you would assume is kept somehow in quality, right? Yeah. And, it doesn't, you know, the data that you collect is independent of that assumption. That's correct. And so, but we're already in the state, for example, in the, the, um, uh, the synthesis farm, the synthesizer we first put in there was our first cluster gen synthesizer. And there's a bunch of work that's been done by me and John over the last um, year, which substantially improves the quality of the synthesizer. And so we just put that new build process in. And so if you go back and there's a new version, you just say build again, and it will build it. Um, so you would actually get better um, uh, synthesis out of it as the underlying technology improves as well. So you think that the data you collect basically can be reused? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, so you know, something that we don't admit to all of our users is we get all their data on our server. Okay? 
And this is just so cool because we actually get all of this data from multiple languages that's, that's <coughs> the sort of data that people actually put into this system. That's also the, it's the right type of data that we want to be able to improve our algorithms on. Can we write things to automatically detect when the person didn't say what we expected them to say? Can we automatically write things to try and find out when they're making errors in the pronunciation? Okay? And so can we tune our data on the types of errors that we're actually going to get in real life? So all of these things are perfectly reasonable. And so this is something we're, 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 we're pleased that we get all this data. And for example, when I did my ICAS paper on this new synthesis technique, I could say, and we tried it in 14 different languages, and they all improved, actually apart from one. Um, okay. So that, that's a nice position to be in. Okay. So how many? The, you throw out a bunch of different classes of language. Yes. But if you wanted to cover cover enough languages, yeah. so that you know ninety nine percent of the people on Earth go to the system and say, "I'm fluent in one of your languages." Right, right. What's that number? Is that um, more like hundred or more like? No, thousands? it's more like hundred. I don't actually know that number. But supposing you want to be able to cover, I don't know, ninety percent of the people on the planet. You know, once you get the top forty languages, you're pretty close to being able to do that. Right. Okay, and you know this is a this is a difference of like. Supposing you're a big company like, I don't know, Microsoft, okay, and you're trying to, the cost of being able to support a new language is a million dollars to be able to do that. You're only going to do that for the ones that are actually going to be financially worthwhile or you're legally required to do it, okay. So uh, I worked with some group who were doing Spanish speech stuff and it's for Spain and they had to do Spanish, Catalan, um, Galician and Basque, which, you know, the last two are not worthwhile from a commercial point, but, you know, but, but apart from that. But that's not what we're aiming at. That's fundamentally not what we're aiming at. What we're aiming at is the person who wants to do Ojibwe Native American. Okay? And you know, Nuance and Microsoft and Google are never going to care about those languages. They're just too small. But the people who speak that language do, and they may want the support to be able to do that. And so we're giving it to them as a developer. And take it this way. Supposing that um, uh, the only people who could develop websites okay, were um, you know, major big companies, IBM, Nuance, uh, uh, Google, Apple, and nobody else could do it. Okay, and you had to ask them to develop the website for you. Okay, uh, that would be a pain because you'd only get the big websites and you wouldn't get the little websites. Okay, but if you give them the technology that they can build the website, then you get many, many more. Okay, so it's this you know long tail um, uh, type thing that those it's the end user that's going to care. The end developer is going to care about supporting the language, and it's taking it away from the million dollar um, uh, coverage into the end user caring, caring about doing it. So if you only care about having a language that people can actually speak to the system, the commercial systems are going to do that. Uh, the, the cell phone manufacturers typically quote 46 um, different languages that they want to support. It's a different 46 from different languages, but it's always 46. And I do find that interesting. Um, uh, and those are the ones that are clearly in the commercially viable ones. Okay? But there are still languages with 50 million speakers that, have, that are not in that 46, okay? mostly in India. <laughs> and that's where we're moving. So we're not saying companies are going to support this. What we're saying is the developer is going to support this. Right. Yeah, right. That, yeah that's yeah. not what I was getting at, but right. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Sorry, what were you getting at? Did I miss? <laughs> well, it's... Uh, we don't have a clock. Well, we, we don't have, have a clock. We have plenty of time. The, um, if, if I'm motivated to use a speech-to-speech -speech system, yep. like uh, like your students have developed, yep. uh, the goal is communication. Yes. And so you want to go from a language Mike is fluent in to a language I'm fluent in. Yep. And in that case, um, if someone speaks fluent North American English, uh, you don't have you don't have to cover you know the Indian dialect that right. they have. Right. 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 Um, that Mike is a native speaker. Yes. yes, that Mike is a native speaker. Yes. Yeah. If you want to produce, if you, I mean, I, I suppose there's other cases where you want to um, dictate into the computer and have a speech text system work in your native language. You can produce a document that someone else can read. No. Okay. So, so here's, here's, I'm trying to figure out okay, what so the cases are right, where okay. you would care. Uh, so I'm going to give language. you a bunch of applications which we've been explicitly uh, um, uh, asked about, which I think this technology really solves. Okay, um, Native American um, languages are dying. 
Uh, most of the people who speak them natively are over 60, over 70. Okay? But there is a bunch of young people who would really love to be able to speak them. But young people, as we know, can't actually uh, speak to people. They have to be able to use SMS to communicate with people. They have to be able to type things online with instant messages. Okay? There's no support for Ojibwe in any form of SMS type things. If you could provide them with a technology in Ojibwe such that these younger people can hear the data okay, and speak the data when they don't know how to write it, okay, you're actually going to improve their language capability. And as far as they're concerned, that is part of the language. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, they're only going to communicate in English. So being able to preserve languages is one way to be able to do that. Because if you do just give, you know, the technology only goes into, um, you know, use English when you're actually doing that and you're only going to chat to your immediate friends when actually we now communicate worldwide and it would be better to be able to keep these communities together. That's one. Um, there's a project that we're involved with and Microsoft's involved with. I um, don't know some of you. Um, uh, one of Ronnie Rosenfeld's students who's working in Pakistan of trying to provide... Um, speech-based support for health workers in um, Pakistan. Jay. Hmm? Jay. Jay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Jahan Zab. Um, and uh, he's in a position where the people that he's dealing with have some training, but they're really not literate in, in Urdu, it would be in that case. Okay. But they do speak other languages. And he wants to be able to support some language that isn't Urdu, that's the second language in Pakistan I can't remember the name of. Okay. And there isn't any support anywhere for that. And he would like to be able to use a system like this to be able to build up the support to be able to do that because there isn't any support. And yeah, you know, it's only tens of millions of people, okay? But it's a way to be able to do that. So there's another one where Jay is capable of doing this, but he needs software and be able to technique to be able to do this. Um, the third one that came up recently was um, uh, uh, some local people in Pittsburgh that run um, a, a refugee um, aid association for people who are coming into Pittsburgh. They've suddenly got a, um, a whole bunch of people who are from, I mean, many hundred of people coming in who are from South Burma. They speak a language called Karen, which I'd never heard of before. Um, and they want to be able to communicate with them. And they've got one translator who speaks English. Okay? And how can the organization be able to tell everybody that there's going to be a meeting next week, uh, um, but uh, they can't actually say it. And what they wanted to do, which we did, we set up basically a Karen synthesizer such that it could call each of the persons and give them data about when the next meeting was. Okay? Now, that's something where, you know, big company is not going to support Karen in a hurry, but these people were interested, they did have one translator, and you could use that translator to be able to help bootstrap a system which could then communicate with lots of people. So there are lots of examples about this where, you know, think about the website thing. It's not a big person, it's the little people that are actually wanting to do that, and they want to be able to get access to the technology to be able to do that. Okay? It's a different thing from the doing the dictation type mm -hmm. um, task. It's low-level communication, which could be translation, and it could just be the dialogue system that gives you information about something. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, how many? Like, do you have any languages um, that people have used the system so far um, to create like a significant number of different instances of a language? Like, like fifteen different people have tried to create have used the system to create. Like, yeah. Um, so no, actually. Um, we haven't, but we really want to be able to do that. And Kishore, my student, who's uh, also faculty at uh, IIIT in Hyderabad, is going to use it in his class and get 15 people to do Hindi. So we can actually then look at the cross information about that. Yeah, I'm so, curious about how, what the consistency looks yeah, like. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Make, make yeah. the same points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a very good question because. Um, the point ultimately is that when you make any decision about a speech process, you don't really know whether you're making the right decision. And being able to do it well with multiple people is something that we'd really like to be able to do. And that was the direction that we were going to do with that. Hindi or Telugu, but some language which most of the students can speak um, and get them all to do it and then do some comparison, cross-comparison about it. Yeah, it's a good idea. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you.